Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, Dario from Next Pharma Summit. It's our seventh session of Next Innovation Week with a very interesting title, Patient Empowerment Practical Digital Innovations. Uh, so I would say that here we immediately see two very crucial keywords. We see digital, because these days and during COVID, we of course accelerated the whole digital transformation, but we also see uh, patient centricity. And uh, I'm really glad to hear uh, after six sessions, which we have done uh, during Next Innovation Week, we, we see a huge shift toward patient centricity and definitely our industry has uh, taken this path, which makes me very, very happy because I just mentioned to some of our panelists uh, when we uh, joined the session that just a couple of years ago, a typical pharma conference would be like 90% related to uh, commercial excellence, while, while these days we see a huge shift toward, towards patient centricity and putting patients first and around our industry. Uh, so really pleased to welcome uh, our four amazing panelists for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Kim from Norgin. Hi, Kim, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you. Kelly Torp from uh, Papyrus. Uh, hi, Kelly, how are you? Morning, I'm really good, thank you. Thank you. Philip Cruz from GSK. We all hope in GSK. Hi, Philip. How are you? <laughs> Very well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And Chris Finch from Earthworld. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. Good to be here. Great. Just a couple of interesting information uh, in terms of Next Innovation Week. So in total, we are having more than 1,500 unique registrants for our 10 sessions with 40 different uh, speakers coming from Pharma, of course. Uh, across five days and 10 sessions in total. So I said, this is our seventh session. And before we start, before we start the conversation of today, uh, I would like to encourage anyone uh, to ask and raise questions if you have them. And later on, we will uh, pick some of the most interesting questions and ask towards our panelists. Uh, also, before we start the proactive discussion, I would like to uh, pass the stage to Chris who will be setting the stage with some very interesting insights uh, about patient centricity. So Chris, the stage is yours. He really prepared a very interesting uh, presentation, especially since I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. So <laughs> looking forward. <laughs> Thank you, Dario, and good morning to everybody that's uh, on the call this morning, and thank you very much to the team at Next for inviting me to open the session today about patient empowerment. Um, when I think about patient empowerment, for me, it's, it's all about understanding how we can help patients have as much control over their journey through treatment as possible. And over the years at Earthware, we've come to realize that a patient's journey shares many similarities with the hero's journey. Um, which was first identified in 1949 by an academic called Joseph Campbell. Now, Campbell analyzed myths and legends and religious stories from communities all over the world, and he identified a common thread, which he refers to in his book as the hero monomyth. And since then, filmmakers and authors such as George Lucas credit this book as the inspiration behind epic stories and films like Star Wars, Harry Potter, Aladdin, Warship Down, Finding Nemo, and many, many more. All of these stories follow a similar pattern. It's become known as the hero's journey. Now, rather than believe that heroes only exist in films and books, I believe that there are everyday heroes all around us, being brave, doing good, and being admired. And certainly during this COVID pandemic, we've all come to appreciate that healthcare workers are everyday heroes. But some heroes don't choose their path, it's thrust upon them, and at Earthware, we believe that patients faced with often life-changing illnesses are in their own ways heroic, battling against adversity, striving to change the course of their future and the future of their family and loved ones. And I believe that we as an industry can play a really key role in helping patients to become the heroes of their own healthcare journeys. So what can we learn from the hero's journey that can help us to achieve this goal? Next slide, please, Dario. So today I'm going to use Luke Skywalker from one of my favorite films, as, as Darius already mentioned, Star Wars, uh, to help explain the hero's journey. And for those of you that haven't seen Star Wars, firstly, 
where have you been for the last 40 years? But secondly, if you don't know who Sky, Luke Skywalker is, please feel free to substitute Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, Captain America, or any other hero from your favorite story or film. The hero's journey always starts with an unassuming character in an ordinary world, uh, like Luke Skywalker here, who's not a hero at all. He's a farmhand who has a talent for fixing droids. Next slide, please, Dario. Now, in a healthcare setting, this could be someone like you and I before we even become a patient. So today I'm going to talk about John. He's 72, he's married to his second wife, and he has three grown-up independent children. John's retired, and he spends his days playing golf and looking after his five grandchildren. Phase one of the hero's journey is where normal is no longer an option. Now, in Luke Skywalker's case, his aunt and uncle are killed, his home is burnt to the ground, and stormtroopers are hunting him down. For John, next slide, please. Um, after ignoring some symptoms for, for some time, he's been persuaded by his wife to go to the GP, who's concerned enough to refer John to an NHS consultant with a suspected diagnosis of bowel cancer. And as you can imagine, this is a really difficult time for John. He doesn't really know much about bowel cancer or what it might mean for his future, but he does know that if he receives a positive diagnosis, his life is likely to be dramatically changed. Next slide, please. In phase two of our hero's journey, our hero meets a mentor and crosses a threshold into a new world. In Star Wars, Luke meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi master who calls him to adventure on the Millennium Falcon bound for Alderaan. In John's case, next slide, um, he meets a consultant and he's informed that he needs some further tests to confirm the diagnosis. Based on the information he's given and his experience with his health healthcare professional so far, at this point, John must choose who he trusts to guide him through his journey. John feels like he, the first consultant didn't really explore all of the options fully with him, and so he decides to go privately with another consultant. Next slide. So we've reached phase three of our, our hero's journey, and this is where characters and a pathway start to emerge. Luke Skywalker is not feeling at all heroic at this stage, as the full scale of the challenge ahead becomes apparent and characters are introduced in a pathway However, unsavory starts to emerge. Next slide. Now on the hero's journey, the emerging characters are often the key to the outcome and they take one of four forms. So we have allies like R2-D2 and Chewbacca, mentors like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda, and villains like Darth Vader. However, often the key to a successful journey lies in the hands of characters that we know as shapeshifters, where you're never sure if they're actually helping the hero or not, like Han Solo. For a patient on their healthcare journey, characters take similar forms. In John's case, his mentors come in the form of his consultant, and in particular, his specialist nurse. Allies emerge in the shape of his friends and his family, and the main villain for John, of course, is the disease itself. But for patients, the world is full of lesser villains that can sometimes creep up unannounced, and these might be things like financial pressures, work commitments, childcare uh, challenges and logistics, all of which need to be overcome. People in the lives of patients can also come in the form of shapeshifters, maybe an unreliable partner or a less than supportive boss. And getting these shapeshifters into a helpful, supportive role can often be crucial in the outcome for the patient. Next slide. In phase four of the hero's journey, the hero faces a trial and an ordeal. In Star Wars, Luke rescues Leia Nearly dies in a refuse compactor, breaks out of the Death Star, sees Obi-Wan die. And sorry if that's a spoiler, but this was 1977. Uh, he's abandoned by Han Solo, and ultimately he has to blow up the Death Star as his final big ordeal. For John, his first big ordeal is his colonoscopy. And in the days leading up to the procedure, John is anxious, and he finds, finds the bowel prep process the evening before particularly stressful. However, he does undergo the procedure, and that does confirm a diagnosis of bowel cancer. John's consultant recommends surgical intervention, followed by chemotherapy, and these are further trials and ordeals that John has to face on his journey. In phase five of the journey, our hero triumphs and starts on the road back to their new normal life. Luke blows up the Death Star, and whilst the Empire remains at large, the path towards a successful outcome for the Rebel Alliance has already been set. In John's case, next slide please, his surgery is successful, is successful, but his journey back to full health takes time. And there are some ups and downs along the way, 
including some challenging side effects from chemotherapy that he needs to overcome. In the final step of our hero's journey, our hero crosses the threshold into their, into their new normal world with an elixir. In the case of Luke, he now has control of the force, has a lightsaber in his hand, and he's on the path to becoming a Jedi Knight. For John, next slide, please. Um, he emerges into a new normal world of regular tests and reviews. His six month review is very positive and John feels like he's leaving the days of cancer behind. He now has the elixir of knowledge on how to monitor his condition and spot any signs of the cancer returning. And 12 months later, by chance, a friend receives a similar diagnosis and John offers to have a quiet chat down the pub about his experiences and becomes a mentor on his friend's journey. Now, Whilst John may be unlikely to consider himself a hero, you would probably agree that he would meet the definition of being someone who has done something brave, new or good, and who is you know, admired by a lot of people. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, that's a, that's a nice story, Chris, but how does that apply to my life as a professional working in a pharmaceutical company or a patient group or a healthcare provider? Well, have you ever noticed that nobody seems to make films or writes books about the people that never quite become a hero? And at Earthware, we've become a bit obsessed with this concept of the nearly heroes, the patients that don't quite make it through to the elixir. And I believe it's our job as an industry to help make sure as few patients as possible are nearly heroes, helping them instead to reach their own elixir on their journey. To do this, we must explore what problems patients face on their journey, the pains, and what opportunities there are to make things better, which we call the gains. Next slide, please, Dario. So if we dig a little bit more into John's journey, we can see that there are lots of opportunities to, opportunities to have improved his experience and to have helped him along. I've just got a few examples here of pains in red and gains in green. And if we look, for example, at phase four of his journey, as John prepared for his colonoscopy, could a company maybe have provided him with a VR experience to help him understand what's gonna happen to him on the, during the procedure and, and trying to relieve his anxiety. Now, often in workshops that we run, we find that there are tens, maybe hundreds of pains and gains. And what we try to do is seek to identify the ones that we can, that can have the biggest impact on the patient's journey. Identifying and understanding the patient journey and where we can improve it is really the secret to creating more patient heroes and avoiding them becoming nearly heroes. Next slide, please, Dario. So whilst some of this may seem a bit ethereal, I challenge all of you, when you go back to your day job, put yourselves in the shoes of your patients and ask yourself, what could we do to help our patients become the heroes of their healthcare journeys? And you may just feel like a hero yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. It was very interesting and hopefully you didn't spoil Star Wars to anyone. So, <laughs> Okay, so let's start for, with an with a interactive discussion. Uh, based on that, I would like to proceed with my first question. And this is obvious, actually, what are the practical digital innovations for patients these days? Because once again, we all see digital transformation is accelerated. There is no pharma company who didn't enter it in, in this space, right? Uh, which means these days it's quite crowded in, in terms of digital transformation, in terms of digital engagement. But let's put it in a simple way and uh, really glad to hear what are the exact and pure practical digital innovations for our patients. Maybe we can start with Kim because she was uh, the first on my on my screen when I <laughs> introduced that. So Kim, can you maybe share your insights about that question? Yeah, no problem. Um, just as kind of an aside, we're literally in the middle of doing the exact kind of patient journey pains and gains things that Chris talked about today. I'm actually here early. I've got someone covering for me. And as soon as this happens, I'm jumping off to talk to some real patients about their next steps and their journey. So um, we find that very useful. But we start doing that whenever we're doing anything kind of practical or thinking up new solutions uh, before we even get there. Um, and a couple of options, you know, a couple of things that we've really found extremely useful. One thing that kind of Chris already touched on, and we're in the colonoscopy space, um, is we do have a patient chat bot for particular um, bowel prep that we that we make. And we find that extremely useful 
because it's in the right part of the journey for the right reason. And actually patients really find that useful to ask the questions that they would never kind of be able to just call up and ask, especially when you're doing it really late at night or really early in the morning before a procedure. And what we're finding is those sort of things where it's not instead of healthcare input, it's not instead of healthcare um, interventions or consultant appointments or any sort of thing like that. It's something that's in addition, but saves the healthcare professionals time. That's where we get kind of a triple win, a win, you know, a win for patients, a win for us and a win for the healthcare system. We're not here to replace them. We're here to give them more time to do something else. So they're not getting asked those simple questions. And we've also got um, the, the latest thing we've done is kind of do an app where we're tracking people's um, cognitive function over time for patients with liver disease. And what we're finding is that's just giving people the data that they would require when they're running a consultant clinic for liver disease so that they're not spending 10, 15 minutes of an appointment time or time in a hospital with a patient doing the tests, they can just kind of get up the results and they've had them for, for over a long time. So those sort of things where we can have that triple win is really important for us. Thank you, Kim. I really need to add that actually Norgen is one of my favorite companies when it comes to patient centricity because they are really leveraging it in a cross-functional uh, across across all the company, which is really very, very special. Uh, let's hear the practical digital innovations from the side of GSK. Philip, would you kindly proceed? Yeah, thank you very much, Darry. And I think really just to build upon what Chris outlined as the hero's journey and what Kim is going into, I think what's really key to recognize is you have that patient empowerment definitely as a goal, but eventually you want to kind of have it activated and therefore you have a patient who is engaged. Because especially now where you have chronic conditions and with the advancement of medicine and therapeutic interventions, you have quite a complicated uh, patient journey in terms of getting better. So there are many touch points where technology can help. It's more about uh, augmenting patient care. It's not about technology will, will not replace uh, actual patient management, patient care. It's there to augment and help the physician in making the right decision for the patient, be it you know accurate monitoring through smart device, devices and the like. But for my experience really, because I work in the vaccine space, where you're dealing with patients who are healthy or patients who are, or healthy patients or healthy individuals where they don't have the disease because it's all about preventative health. And the important factor to consider there is their desire for information. And COVID-19 in terms of the pandemic has brought forth a need which is to be empowered in terms of knowing. They, there is a desire to be well informed. And this is key because what we want is a patient who more or less goes into, let's say, a scheduled clinic visit empowered with the right information. And therefore you minimize the time that you are there and therefore have a more effective patient physician uh, relationship and visit. So I think really the cornerstone of how digital applications would be on patient empowerment is to provide the right information in the right manner at the right time. Thank you, Philip. Let's move to another angle, which is a patient group, a very interesting one from which Kelly is coming. And by the way, congratulations on the videos about the bedtime stories. Really love them. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, practic practical digital innovations from a patient group and uh, do you see some progress, especially in these days during COVID-19 pandemics, right? Yeah, thanks, Dario. Um, yeah, just echoing what um, uh, the other panelists have said, really. Obviously for us, um, empowerment is exactly our business because we are dealing with young people who are feeling suicidal. So it's really interesting to have a look at digital innovations in terms of um, patients or people's emotional well-being alongside that physical well-being. Um, we run a helpline and young people will contact us who are feeling suicidal. 
And we very quickly realised by listening to those young people and putting what they were saying right at the very centre of everything that we do was that they needed a bit more. Um, you know, Chris was talking about how difficult it is for our heroes to talk about their physical well-being in terms of, um, you know, the kind of investigations, the, the, how scary it all is. And that's very similar when people are talking about their emotional well-being. So um, we were, we've been very lucky to, to work alongside Earthware in terms of developing something called a, an online suicide safety plan, which empowerment is, is right at the core. So it's for young people to take um, some control over that tiny bit of the life, actually, in, in order to um, move forwards in their journey. Life at the moment for all of us is so uncertain, isn't it? So for us to be uh, allowing people to take some control back over their um, journeys in terms of treatment, be that physical or emotional well-being, is, is really important. And um, yeah, we're really proud of that because that's what we do every single day is put that voice of our um, service users right at the centre of everything we do. So yeah. Thank you. Chris, from a solution vendor perspective, uh, first of all, I would definitely like to mention that uh, we consider your solutions as state of the art when, when it comes to digital. <laughs> but uh, what's your opinion and learning in terms of practical digital innovations, once again, especially in these days, because we are all entered in this uh, digital transformation process, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I've seen kind of three areas where I think digital innovations are being used to help patients and, and actually the other panelists have touched on some of these already. But um, for me, the first area is is in providing patients um, with instant access to information and the right information. So chatbots is an example of that that, that Kim talked about. Um, but it's also, you know, potentially using social media channels, you know, just just giving patients the information when they need it and where they want to, to get it from. I think the second area is in uh, digital tools to help patients pro become much more proactive in managing their condition. So that might be apps for patients with chronic diseases. Um, it might be, um, I think AI actually has a role to, to play in this. So for example, in mental health, we've started to see you know, personal healthcare assistance um, built on conversational AI that can, um, you know, they're, they're really smart. They're using cognitive behavioral therapy techniques to, to help patients manage their mental health. Um, and I think the third area, um, which Kim touched on as well, is, is, the, is diagnostic tools. So we're starting to see, well, for some time now, we've been seeing kind of wearable technology coming in that's starting to help identify uh, conditions that uh, early that, you know, patients maybe don't know that they've got. Um, so cardio cardiovascular health, for example, is one area that, where that's being used. Um, um, but also, in, you know, the, the, the app that Kim mentioned, you know, using cognitive tests to help um, early diagnosis of patients with potentially fatal brain conditions. So I think th those are the three areas. It's, it's access to information, it's proactive management of, of disease, and it's diagnosis. That's where I see digital tools really starting to come to the fore. Thank you, Chris. Next question. How to create a cross-functional patient-driven organization? Well, that's the key, definitely. And here I would like to start with Kelly because uh, she's definitely dealing with uh, all stakeholders from the ecosystem. And uh, therefore, I believe she might give some very interesting insights, right, Kelly? I will certainly try. Um, so I think, again, it, it's just running alongside what, what everyone else has said. It's putting the voice of uh, the patients or the stakeholders right at the very centre of, of everything that we do and um, ensuring that that information is up to date and that it's sound and that it's valid um, and it's easy to access. So um, quite often uh, what we hear is young people get quite confused with uh, medical speak or technical jargon. Um, so it's keeping things simple and accessible for all um, on a number of, of different platforms. So what we've learned during the pandemic is young people have found it very difficult to uh, have their voice and, and pick up the telephone and, and speak to us directly in order to 
manage their thoughts of suicide and stay safe. So we have very quickly had to uh, adapt the way that we work. Uh, and this is just an example, really, of, of putting those people at the very fore. Um, so we're at the moment uh, trying to work out a timeline to get a, a, a web chat running so that we can still have those immediate conversations with young people about suicide, empower them to stay safe from acting on those thoughts of suicide in a very different way. So obviously, um, helplines are, are very different in their own right in comparison to you know, face-to-face -face consultations and that kind of thing. So uh, we've had to think outside the box a little bit and uh, kind of step into the world of young people, vulnerable young people. Um, and we can only do that by listening to them. And obviously listening to those people who are dealing with vulnerable young people, so professionals out there in the field, parents particularly, and sadly parents who have been bereaved by suicide, to kind of make those changes and reach those people in the right ways at the right time. Thank you, Kelly. Philip, could you kindly proceed with the same answer? The key uh, there, definitely, and the key there is to be a patient advocate yourself. And for us uh, working in industry, what we are very conscious about is where to get those insights directly. And to give you an example, uh, we're uh, working on meningitis, uh, the disease itself and how to prevent it. So we're uh, closely collaborating with patient organizations uh, such as Meningitis Now and Meningitis Research Foundation. So putting them at the center, you know, hearing the patient stories because oftentimes we kind of like stop at treating the patient or preventing the disease, but what happens to the ones who survive and have all of these complications? So it's understanding the journey end to end. So that's where collaborations uh, with patient organizations is key. And for us, it's all about being conscious also what outcomes or patient related conditions are relevant to them and which they give importance to. So it's for us understanding that, uh, really lengthily and more uh, in a way that's uh, very much uh, patient-centric in that sense. So working closely with them and even kind of uh, designing all our objectives around those. For example, when we would design clinical trials, it's now looking at what specific outcomes that we want to prevent against. Like, you know, there are disease outcomes which are more relevant to the patient because it impacts on their quality of life. So it's all about hearing them, what is important to them, and recognizing that and applying it in what we do. Thank you, Philip. Chris, from a solution vendor perspective, how do you see this from a, from a different angle? Well, I think for me, and as somebody that's worked both in a pharma company and now as a, as a vendor, um, it's, it's all about a, mind sh a mindset shift. Um, I think pharmaceutical companies traditionally, and certainly back when I worked in the industry, were always a little bit reluctant to talk directly to patients and, and mainly for compliance reasons. So there was a concern, can we, can we actually do this compliantly? Um, and I think sometimes it was almost used in, as an excuse as, as to kind of why, why not to, to engage with patients. Um, but I've definitely seen as, as power to a certain extent has shifted away from marketing teams and much more towards the medical affairs teams in, in pharmaceutical companies pharmaceutical companies, I've, I've seen that changing. And as Philip mentioned there, I've seen a lot more companies really engaging with patient groups um, and involving patient groups, not just you know at the beginning of projects, but actually keeping them engaged right the way through projects. Um, so they're really kind of steering, steering the direction of, of travel. But it's always interesting to me actually to see that um, I've never seen a pharma company yet to, to employ patients within their business in a kind of permanent consultancy capacity. And I do wonder whether that's that's something that we as an industry should start looking at. So rather than just bringing patients in ad hoc on projects, actually having patients sitting within our, our, our commercial teams, advising us all the time and, and what patients actually want and what patients actually need. Because um, we've done it with medics, we, we, we bring healthcare professionals into our teams within pharmaceutical companies. So I'm, I'm wondering why we haven't really yet, or I haven't seen it yet, where, where patients have been brought in as employees within a business to help make sure that everything we do is with the patient in mind. So um, I'd be interested to hear from, from the, the, the people on the call today, Philip and, and Kim that work in pharmaceutical companies, whether that's something that they've actually considered or, or where it, maybe it's even happening in their, their companies. Kim, same question for you. I said 
Lord yeah, is quite yeah. so this cross functional patient centricity, right? Mm. And um actually that's a really good point, Chris. I mean, what we actually we do ask people if they have any experience internally and we do have some people that are what they call kind of professional patients outside of their work that do advise us on other things they're not in our therapy area but actually it still has some impact and I think um kind of listening to all of it I agree Chris with we have a tendency to go oh we can't talk to patients directly we have to go through a patient organization we have to go that way and it's very strict and, and contractual and it's very clear um we kind of have the view that we're trying to talk to patients for a truly ethical reason we are trying to do the best we possibly can for them then why can't we in the spirit of the codes and all of these sort of things in the spirit actually do that in a transparent and um, sensible way so actually we do go directly to patients as well as patient organizations and actually i found that so much more impactful than just um just working with a patient organization i think we always have them as well because they have kind of a big breadth of things and breadth of knowledge and breadth of understanding but do you know what some of those key just one personal stories and and, and one person has just such an emotional impact on everything that we do and it really does help us get out of bed um so for instance we're you know we're doing this kind of patient two-day workshop online at the moment and the we've got people from regulatory we've got people from almost every affiliate we have and we just cover europe so it's a bit easier for us we've got commercial we've got sales we have medical we have clinical development we've got obviously digital we've got some people from it um, we've got um, some people kind of more facilities joining us who may not actually do all of the work and we've got finance even you know they're not kind of on the ground with these people but the fact that they get to be involved and join in and, and give their experience and input as well just means that everyone has this view of well actually I know why I'm doing my job so I'm going to do it a little bit better or I'm going to just make sure I do that extra thing and we do that a lot in terms of all the kind of big projects we do that kind of impact patients directly and all of our materials that are patient driven at a global level go through a patient panel of real people to just check to see if we've got it right because most of the time we're too stuck in jargon and acronyms and everything so I think that's really key for us and getting those people involved and we have lots of videos of patient stories that are just for us internally to just get a grip on what's going on um, and have that emotional connection and I think that's kind of key for us. Thank you Kim. Let's move to the next question and start with Chris which is Quite interesting because we all know that a pandemic will leave some really serious mental damages and other health conditions but how can we use technology to overcome this so what's your opinion and experience chris with that yeah i mean you know it's been it, i think the last six to 12 months have been you know incredibly stressful on on everybody globally and um Unfortunately, I don't have a silver bullet to an answer this question, but I think there are some interesting studies coming through with some, some good evidence to suggest that um, patients are more willing to share personal thoughts and concerns, or some patients are more willing to share personal thoughts and concerns with virtual assistants than, um, than, than real humans. So I think there is a potentially a role for AI to play, or artificial intelligence to play, in offering patients tailored Kind of in the moment advice and information particularly particularly around mental health um, i also think technology has got a role in in helping patients feel connected to other people like them and we've seen you know there's lots of successful patient social networks out there now um, like health unlocked for example that shows that patients really do benefit from having access to to other people with their disease where they can just talk on a on a peer to peer level and exchange ideas and exchange experiences and you know that mentor role that I talked about in the hero's journey you know you, patients can really be be great mentors for other patients like them um so i think if, if i think from a pharmaceutical perspective um there's an opportunity to potentially partner with kind of these patient social networks 
to provide access to, to their information in, in, in the places where patients are going and seeking out help and support um, themselves. Sure, Philip, would you continue with the same question? Yeah, sure. Uh, but before that, I'd like to uh, answer the, the question that Chris posed with regards to patient involvement. Uh, with the pharmaceutical industry. So given that there's a robust uh, governance framework, I think really what we need to consider is no two patients have the same journey. So it's difficult if you would engage with just an individual. So it's better that it would be more on, let's say, a patient organization who can provide the, the actual patients who can uh, give their account and their kind of experience that would help in the decision making. So I think really, yes, there's that uh, opportunity that we can do more with patients. However, I think it's really just confined under a string governance framework that they're not exposed to any kind of commercial or marketing strategy, just looking at the actual therapeutic journey. Now, going to the question about mental health, especially during the pandemic, the key there is to address misinformation. I think really what what is um, really, there's also an infodemic, uh, a pandemic of misinformation sometimes that's amidst us. And this is important to address because once there is like a program, a public health program, where the key to success is to get as much of the population involved, be it a vaccination program or a public health measure, the key there is to deliver the right information at the right time. I know easier said than done. However, that should be our aspiration and that should be our goal. Because studies have shown that a majority of, let's say, I would give an example of vaccine hesitancy, is those who are in between, those who are misinformed or lack the access to information. So it's important to address that need especially when we go to now addressing a pandemic where everyone's cooperation, everyone's um, effort is needed to address it. So addressing misinformation, thereby allaying any kind of mental uh, uh, challenges and understanding is key. Thank you. Kelly, could you proceed with the same question? I believe you have some very fresh and interesting insights, especially since you're dealing to be concreted mental health conditions, right? Yeah, I, I think we need to acknowledge that it's been and will be very difficult for all of us for some time to come, won't it, in terms of um, the almost hangover of the pandemic, you know, when whatever over looks like. So I, I think for me, it's acknowledging that, but also acknowledging how we have all managed to rise to the challenge and still turn up and stay passionate about what we do and, and, and make a difference. And I think sharing those celebrations and rising to those challenges with our service users or our patients will empower them to continue doing the same. Um, and, and I agree with what already has been said, actually, in terms of um, we need to up our game in terms of uh, you know, digital solutions in order to drive connectivity and get, make sure that information is um, right and proper and shared at the, at the right time. Um, it's an interesting one because what we have seen um, in particular on, on our little helpline that's kind of looking after the young people all across the UK, um, the, the themes around emotional well-being challenges has, has certainly changed. Um, which won't be a surprise really. So historically we saw um, particular mental health diagnoses were coming through to us quite a lot, things like depression and anxiety and particular personality disorders, et cetera. And what we've seen is, it, is a real shift actually in terms of what people are telling us that is kind of impacting on their thoughts of suicide. And it definitely is things around um, loneliness and isolation, that lack of connectivity. Um, the inability to have um, meaningful consultations with the right people in their lives, those people that support them, be that their GP or their mental health professionals in their lives. And I do appreciate that, you know, digital solutions have gone a long way now to, to bridge that gap. 
But I think the initial struggle was empowering service users to take that on and, and use it in a, in a way that they would find useful. I think that's getting a little bit better. Um, I think maybe whether, you, you know, young people or, or the communities ourselves are feeling more empowered to do it and like I am today, you know, get up there and, and speak and, and, and embrace it. Um, it's difficult when you've not done those kinds of things before. So when you're feeling vulnerable, it's it's even harder. So, yeah, for us, I think anything that continues to put the journey of the young person right at the centre, um, that their story isn't over, that they can become those heroes by um, checking in with those digital uh, safety plans that we have. And, yeah, that the, that the information is, is right and proper. And, and you're right, Philip, it's very hard to um, hide away from fake news at the moment, isn't it? And it's very difficult to navigate your way around what is actually happening out there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think my message is that we just need to look after ourselves in our own spaces as well, where we can to stay emotionally well. Thank you. Kim? So, I think the pandemic's kind of helped in some ways to kind of increase the amount of people that are willing to engage on kind of a digital level because a lot of people have been forced into it and they've tried it and gone oh okay so it's not so bad actually I can do this right um which is quite interesting but I also think there's going to be an impact on the amount of people that are willing to you know phone helplines and I think Kelly's already touched on this or um go face to face to things because we've been so kind of isolated and and we got so used to kind of this digital and just messaging or using chat functions and things I think it's going to reduce the amount of people that are going to try and use their voice and have real kind of human contact on it and I've seen lots of people and I've I've spoken to a lot of people that are now kind of well I don't want to go out it's much night you know I, I've got used to it indoors um and I think that hangover is going to be a, quite a while and I think a lot of the things that we need to do is also helping people to encouraging them to still get to the face-to-face -face appointments and doctor appointments and screenings and all that sort of thing because what I'm really worried about is the amount of people that are now too worried about going to these screening appointments or going to hospital or are even kind of, of doing those things and I think that's where that kind of mental challenge of getting over that is going to be a big impact on health overall. Um, we're kind of doing a lot of work on such, and we did surveys on people's view of risk of going into hospital for, you know, um, bowel cancer screening or um, other cancer screenings and things. And a lot of people are saying, well, I don't want to go in there. I don't want to get sick. And actually, you're going to, you might get sicker if you don't because if you miss cancer that's a big thing but people are too scared of kind of the COVID situation and some of that is misinformation that as soon as you walk into hospital you're going to get you know you're, you're going to test positive and that's it actually you know we need to be doing more as an industry of, of helping people understand that you know it's actually you can do this you need to do this um, and actually a lot of our digital stuff we've tried to kind of we're going to change some of it to say actually you do need to go and see someone face to face or push to get more of a face to face consultation for that um, and for some things I think we really need to push that message but I think that's going to be a bit of an uphill battle from months in isolation and staying at home and doing all these video calls instead. Thank you Kim. In the meantime, we received a very interesting question addressed to Philip. So I would kind of like to ask Philip for his answer. And the question is, during the pandemic, how does the GSK vaccine group reach out to its target patients? And what digital tools are used and how are these optimized? Very interesting question, in fact. Indeed it is, and very timely and relevant, especially nowadays. So I think really what we are referring to as digital uh, in terms of uh, for our for our space, it's a vaccine discovery. So we're using uh, technologies as well, especially in the realm of vaccine discovery. However, that is more towards the science. And I think the question is, <clears throat> what uh, measures are we doing in terms of patient education and you know getting the right information in the right manner? So the 
importance there, first of all, to answer another of, of the uh, topics here is to always uh, go with your trusted sources. And research that we have done, uh, not just in GSK, but our public health authorities have done as well, is that the majority of the public still believe, and thankfully, with their uh, healthcare professionals. So the trust is there. And that is one thing that we can leverage upon, is to have the healthcare professionals empower their patients through providing the right pieces of information. And I know there's one kind of digital application out there. It's not really groundbreaking, but telemedicine is somehow being employed now in the front lines. A generation ago, that's groundbreaking, but now it's used to augment patient care and patient assessment. It's not a substitute to the total patient um, care uh, journey. However, it's good to have those frequent touch points and it acts like a triage for you to determine if there is a need for a patient to go into a health center or the A&E or the hospital. And I just like want to echo Kim's message there is, it's important right now to consider if you really need to go to the hospital that you should. Because for us, now is not the right time to get a vaccine preventable disease, for example, which is out there if you don't go for your scheduled routine vaccination visits and the health centers are now more than ever are prepared to handle patients to come in their clinic. So what they do is they do a pre-visit call where they take all the details so you don't need to stay as long more than you should in the clinic or the health center. And there are other ways, let's say, that uh, interventions are being given. For example, in vaccination, there are mobile vaccination clinics. So really right now, what the focus is really just leveraging upon existing technologies and building that up into the healthcare system. But as far as what we are really directly involved in, in terms of uh, vaccine discovery, is also looking at how really the impact of a vaccine once it gets implemented would be successful. So we need to know the factors that uh, would make it uh, in terms of a rollout of a program to be seamless and not being encountered all of these challenges that would block an implementation. So education is key and partnership with public health authorities. So at this point, it's more about preparing for an eventual, let's say, program rollout. Thank you, Phil, very interesting. Let's move forward to the next question, which is uh, quite obvious, right? That patients have to be in center of what we do in our industry. But uh, how can this be achieved? Uh, we listen a lot about patient centricity recently, and also during this uh, so far three days during Next Generation Week. And uh, I think personally that it's definitely culture driven because, uh, you know, th there is a quote which is saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? And uh, if it's not culture driven, then most probably patient centricity just doesn't work. Uh, here I would like to start with uh, Philip, who can maybe uh, share some knowledge and insights from GSK. Yes, yeah, so uh, with regards to putting the patient at the center of what we do is, again, going back to what really is the unmet need in terms of whether it be uh, diseases that needs intervention or in the manner of how, let's say, a therapeutic modality can be better implemented. So it's understanding those, what we call the pain points or the challenges, not just in from vaccine discovery, uh, doing clinical trials up until implementation when a vaccine, let's say, or a therapeutic product is out there in the market. So it's kind of being conscious of the whole journey and pat the patient being there at every step of the way. Because what I can say is that, for example, in vaccines, a vaccine does not work, vaccination does. So if it doesn't get to a patient, it's useless. So that's, I think, the cornerstone of how we think in terms of empowerment, activation, and engagement. Thank you, Philip. Chris, would you please continue? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with everything Philip just said. I mean, I think, for me, I think, as, as, as pharmaceutical organizations, when we're doing our brand plans, the questions we ask ourselves probably need to change. Um, I think traditionally, 
pharma brand teams have kind of when they're when they're doing their brand planning they say you know they ask themselves who do we want to talk to what do we want to say and how do we want to say it and i think that needs to be really flipped on its head and we should be asking you know who are the, who are the potential beneficiaries of our treatment and what are their unmet needs like philip just said what are the pains what are the gains and how can we best help them with those needs and how do they want to be communicated and where do they want to be communicated with and i think if we answer those questions that's when we'll really start to be you know, putting patients right at the center of everything that we do and i think the other thing is and again we've talked about this a lot across the panel today already is is having patients involved right right the way through projects so five or six years ago there was a lot of talk about code design where you know, pharma companies involve patients in, in the design phases of projects but now i think it's all about co-development and we've done big complex projects in mental health where we've had patients with severe mental health involved as core members of the project team right from project inception through to project delivery and on an ongoing kind of evolution of the, of the projects um, because it's only when you have we have patients you know the end users involved that you, you really can meet their needs and design something that's, that's actually going to make a difference and, and help them to become become heroes of their journeys. Thank you, Chris. Kim? Yeah, and I agree. And I know, I understand. I think culture is a really massive thing. Um, what we found is we need kind of core advocates in the functions, the different functions that really push that. So I think it's all fine pushing it down from the top. And I definitely think you need that and I think you need to have your basic um, kind of visions and your basic messaging and your basic view including patients you can't just talk about the your sales numbers and you can't just talk about um, market shares you have to talk about the kind of patient view but I do think you also need from the bottom up those core advocates that are just being pains basically and I pride myself in being annoying all the time is if we're in meetings and we're talking about, OK, we're going to we're going to do this great new website for all these people and stuff. And you're going. Do you think anyone's really going to use that particular thing? Have you actually thought about if you're a real person, are you going to use it? Do you care? Are you going to find it? And actually, that's kind of where you can get a lot of those insights, even if you don't have a patient sat there just going as a person would i really do that as a human being is that going to be what i want to do as much as we get great make these great things unless it's actually useful for a real humor there, there is no point and actually going well i'm a patient for some things i might not be a patient for this particular therapy area but if i was just thinking about if i was in that situation what would happen and that does add a huge weight to kind of what we we do and we do find that you take a different view on it if you just think about it that way um and i have got people to do that before and we've used we use personas um so we're kind of making up the key individuals if we can't get patients in a room all the time and we say you know what would steve think or you know with that that sort of persona and we do say that but i find it much easier to go actually if you're a real person at the end of that how would you find it how would you use it would you even bother and that does kind of distill some of the things and make us a lot a lot more picky about what we do because i think we should be making really good investments and spend money on good things that help real people rather than just doing what we normally do on a brand plan and copy and paste from last year and then add in some new stuff that we think will be great I think that's sometimes where we get a bit stuck. Dario, if I could just add to uh, Kim's point there, because it brings to mind how we conduct meetings. Uh, so in, in, in the company, so we have uh, certain roles that we assume during meetings. One's a decision maker, one's a scribe, one's a timekeeper, and we have a patient monitor. So this patient monitor acts as the voice of the patient. So we have that formalized during the start so that that person who's assigned to be a patient monitor goes into that manner of thinking all throughout the, the meeting and therefore, you know, having that kind of uh, perspective built throughout. So, yeah. I think, just, to, just to echo that, I think that's a great idea. We had a, we, we've got a client who in every meeting room has a red chair and somebody has to sit on that red chair and when they're sitting in the red chair, they are the patient. 
for the voice of the patient. Um, and, and actually having something really visible like that, you know, a, a red chair in a, in a sea of black chairs, it just really, it just really makes you think about what, what would the patient say if they were in this room, what would they say about what we're talking about? Absolutely. Kelly, same question for you. <clears throat> yeah, again, probably just tying all of what's already been said together, really. Um, for us, it's um, one hundred percent knowing what those um, little pain points and challenges are throughout um, in an individual journey. So we use um, a suicide first aid intervention model, which isn't a one size fits all. It's acknowledging that no two human beings are the same. So um, we can kind of tweak and meet the needs of, of that person in that moment. But I also think it goes a bit further than that. It's about actually hearing them and listening and um, ensuring that their voice then steers the way that the, um, you know, the actual strategy in terms of the charity as a whole. So I'm very lucky in my role because I guess I'm the red chair. So as a, as a member of our senior management team, I'm very privileged to be the voice of young people and that is incredible because quite often you find that that gets lost. You know, a job's been done, we've ticked it, but it's actually about learning every single day about how we can get better with it, whether it's digital, whether it's, um, you know, something on the helpline, whether it's the brand, you know, it's will bedtime stories work? Does it, does it speak to the right kind of demographic? Um, it's all of those things, isn't it? And it's, um 100 percent having that red chair in the room and um if that's not possible like kim said be that human being is this going to work for an actual person um so I, I think probably empathy is at the core of that isn't it um just to try and understand and put yourself in the shoes of someone else if they were on that journey what kinds of things might be going on for them or what kinds of things might be going on for you and what those solutions might look like so yeah Sounds easy, but it's not. Of course, it's never easy. <laughs> so three minutes to go. Uh, we received a lot of interesting questions, and uh, I would like to pick two of my personal <laughs> most interesting one and address them individually to once again Philip and uh, the second question to Chris. So let's start first with Philip. We received a quite hot topic question, which is how can pharma tackle vaccine misinformation online, and should we or leave it up to the ACPs? No, uh, we should be in partnership with HCPs would be solution there. And also with public health authorities, because as what I highlighted earlier, there's a still a big trust, thankfully, in the UK for their healthcare professionals and what they say and what they advise. So to address misinformation is to give information because often than not, these are the ones who lack the access to information didn't have the time to ask their GPs or their nurses about certain topics. So we know what topics are out there that is of interest. So what we can do is partner with GPs in providing the right information in, in the right way. So that's one way. And an example there is we conducted a webinar where we were addressing the vaccination challenges during the times of COVID. So the attendees were sharing their experiences, how to overcome those challenges. And a lot of those topics were on misinformation. So we were able to address that amongst healthcare professionals, which then translates to patients and eventually patient care. Thank you, Philip. Maybe we can add on on this and question to Chris from a solution manual perspective. Uh, how adoptive are chat boots as a tool for fighting these misinformations? We, we can't hear you, Chris. Sorry, Dario. Could you just repeat that? I didn't catch the second half of the question. How adoptive are chat boots as a tool for fighting these misinformations? Um, I think chatbots do have a, a great role to play, actually, because um, you know they give they give instant access to questions um, that are asked by patients in you know using their own natural language, um, and the you know all of the answers that go into a chatbot are pre-approved, so they have to be you know the chatbots that we develop for pharmaceutical companies. All of those answers go through through the usual approval processes. They need to be factual. They need to be based. You know, they need to be referenced. Um, most of them actually tend to be based on information that's in the SPC or the patient information leaflet if they're specifically about about products. Um, but I think 
the important thing that we often miss within our industry is how do we then actually, it's, it's great to create a chatbot, but how do you actually get patients to that chatbot? Um, and so thinking about where you, where, you, where you deploy that chatbot is really important because just sticking it on your brand website doesn't necessarily mean patients are going to find it. Um, and we've started looking with some of our clients at things like, can we, can we actually share chatbots you know, as long as they're factual and, and not promotional, can we share those with on charity websites, for example? Or could we could we embed them into ad, advertising that, that patients might be able to access through the advertising? So it's not just about creating the tool, it's about how do you help people find that tool at the right time as well. Thank you, Chris. With that thought, I would like to thank you all for taking part in this very, very interesting session. It was very insightful. Uh, maybe we can do another session related to misinformation and how to deal with it, right? <laughs> this will be very nice and popular these days. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, Kelly, Chris, and Philip. It was really a great pleasure. We will also publish this session next week on our official YouTube channel. Subscribe on that. And uh, stay positive in mind and negative with COVID-19. And uh, take care. All the best. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.